Moving along, I think, to the questions um, from the audience, and um, there were a lot, so let, let me see what I can do. I'm going to, um, I want to try to get through these quickly so everybody answer fast. First question, do most labs perform a rapid fish, and what's the usual turnaround time for mutational testing? Dr. Lee, I'm going to give you that. Mutational testing takes about two weeks um, or a little bit faster in terms of NGS. If you send individual PCRs um, for sub something like FLIP3, uh, turnaround time is two days. I don't know about commercial fish, uh, but fish is something that can come back in about a day or two days. At our institution, our fish can come back, a preliminary can come back next day. So NGS testing is not quick typically, it takes about two weeks. Um, one of our star fellows wants to um, get you guys with the hard questions, so it's an excellent one. Can we stop TKI therapy in the relapse setting after achieving the same um, requirements of MMR? So I think what that's getting at is that what if you stop and then it comes back and can you try it again? So um, actually, this was tried on one of the STOP uh, um, uh, tri uh, trials um, and the EuroSky study as well, that once um, they relapsed, uh, another uh, two, three years passed um, by, and there was an attempt to stop it. And some people actually, um, the idea was that the, uh, the duration of the deep molecular response was important, so it was just continued for a longer period of time. And um, it, it was a very small number, but some people seemed to actually be in TF far um, after stopping it the second time, but there were also patients who, who came back right away, but they again restarted right back. So it's possible, um, um, it's, uh, it, but you have to do something more than what you did in the fir first time. So if you stopped it at three years, then perhaps doing the same would not work and um, go longer for five years, perhaps. Okay, what happens if you have no MMR at 12 months, but there is a complete cytogenetic response? Should, uh, should we switch? I argue that uh, you should continue to monitor because if you look at the data um, on patients who didn't um, achieve MMR, that same population, there didn't seem to be um, a PFS or overall survival difference. Um, in addition, if you look at the second generation data, people do um, achieve MMR at a later time point other than after one year mark. So there does seem to be increase in patients who achieve MMR, so I think you should watch carefully. I'd like to congratulate also the audience on some of these terrific questions. Sometimes I have to say I look at the iPad and I'm just groaning with what's coming through, but these are great. So um, Dr. VB, you're going to cry now. In the first <laughs> clinical case, why not consider continuing with AZA combined with venetoclax? Ooh, ah. Because my leukemia colleagues didn't <laughs> want to do that. and I'm. That raises an important question about transplant. How long do you delay transplant? And how long do you put up with, with the side effects of all this, uh, all this chemotherapies? I don't think, had the patient chosen something like this, uh, one could have done it. But uh, transplant is a one-time treatment that uh, really, when successful, solves a number of problems and, and uh, can bring back perfect quality of life. Whereas ASA venetoclax after failure of ASA will be a time-limited intervention that will be costly, that will may actually impair her further chances for successful transplant. All right, I can't sit still for that. Um, if, <laughs> if, if Thor's hammer hits you in the neck, though, that's rough, right? So here's the thing. Venetoclax-based therapies um, are not approved. I have to say that right away. So that would be an absolutely <laughs> off-label use in a low-risk patient answer. for um, for uh, the, for um, uh, uh, MDS. But I think what the um, author of the question may be getting at is that there are, in fact, emerging data suggesting that the powerful combination of azacitidine and venetoclax in, um, in AML may actually translate into some higher risk MDS patients, and there are expected to be emerging data on that. As to whether or not that translates into the low risk patients, um, I think that is uh, as yet unknown. But I actually, I mean, it's really hard because transplant is the curative therapy 
therapy, but it's also the therapy that does have an actual mortality rate inside of a month. And it's not high, but it's not zero. And I think that's my personal struggle currently with MDS patients and with, um, you know, just how, do you, how do you reconcile the disease being bad enough to actually take an upfront risk to your life in one month? Okay. And even if that risk is low, even if it's 6% or 8% in an excellent program, it's not zero. No, but, okay, since we are debating anyway, <laughs> this is what we do in our daily life. But transplanters are the only ones who are held to very rigorous uh, tabulation of mortalities. Nobody really knows how toxic phenethylaxase acetidine is. I'm convinced that there are people, particularly with cumulative, in the cumulative use, there will be people who die from phenethylaxase acetidine, from opportunistic infections, from prolonged myelosuppression. We've all seen it. So where does one treatment, there's, there's a dogma out here in the field that transplant is by far the most toxic treatment that should be the last resort. But that also deprives a number of patients from improving transplant technologies and, and sending patients later and later. I could give in a couple of days from now another talk on CML, and we see patients with CML treated with five TKIs who have cardiac toxicities who I wish had been sent three years earlier. And so that's the flip side of this. So I guess timing has to be perfect. Yeah. It has to be Goldilocks, not too much and not too little, which I think gets us to this next question nicely, which is also about the first patient. So the, the first questioner is asking why not intensify the therapy by adding another agent, in this case, um, uh, venetoclax off-label. The next question is regarding the same patient, that what about focusing on the transfusion dependency and adding loose patter septs since the it's a refractory anemia patient with a uh, ringed sideroblast. Again, acknowledging that that is not um, an approved drug yet for MDS, but what do you think about focusing on her transfusions? And, uh, and that was again considered, actually, and that was brought up with the patient. I think these are all reasonable approaches, but again, here you have a 65-year-old uh, with where you're going to continue with an indefinite uh, treatment with Luspatercept, where we still don't know the long-term side effects. It's still a new drug. It's still an unapproved drug where she's right now still in a situation that we can offer a curative transplant. So I think these are both reasonable options. And then it all comes down to a discussion with the patients and a weighing of risks and benefits after looking at all the pros and cons.